All right, continuing our series here on the podcast is looking at the at the logistical hurdles some of these sports have to go through on the way back. We have finally landed on the football portion of the podcast. Joining me today, like he's done several times this summer, talking about the logistics of this stuff, our legal correspondent, Phil Freida. Phil, welcome back. How are you? Doing well, Mike. Uh, glad to be back. Thanks for having me. Yeah, glad to have you back. It's nice that you actually get to watch your baseball team this time. Yeah, uh, last time, uh, thanks to the Corona scare with the Marlins and the Phillies and everybody else. I, I didn't get to watch, but I've got the game on right now in the background. Uh, so that, that's uh, that's comforting. It is very comforting. And baseball seems like they've gotten their act together, new protocols coming in place. And now there are reports out that they are talking about doing the bubble like we suggested earlier like this season. They're talking about doing like three stadium bubbles, but like California is mentioned. I think Chicago, Milwaukee is an option, and New York, Philly is an option. They're looking for three ballparks, basically, to run like two sort of hubs. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, last time I was on, we talked about how uh, they should consider that, and I'm happy they are. Uh, I think it's a no-brainer. The Both sides, the players and the owners, have a big interest in getting this postseason completed, and the fans. Uh, so that seems like the most realistic way to do it. I understand that maybe for a regular season, a bubble was impractical, but for a playoff, it seems perfectly feasible, and I think they should get it get it up and running. Yeah, there's another point you brought up last time, too. You said, hey, like, you can't have what's happening in the Cardinals happen in the playoffs. You can't stop the playoff for two weeks, otherwise you're going to run out of time. So putting everybody inside a bubble seems like the smartest way to actually get the season finished, assuming you get there. Yeah, what would you do? Uh, think about it. Let's say the... You know, some team in the playoffs and now there's eight of them in each league. So more than half the league, all it takes is one team down for two weeks. What are you going to do? Do they forfeit the series? It, it becomes a competitive balance issue. So if you do that, uh, you at least minimize the odds of somebody getting the virus as we've seen in the NBA and, and the NHL. I don't think they have a single case. Yeah. We, we don't need to spend any more time on the NBA and the NHL. Like, it's clear the bubbles work. And I think from what I've gathered with baseball, it seems like what they want to do is basically have the eight series take place in the home park. So basically like the home team and the road the home team brings the road team in, they stay and then whoever wins those series probably go with the ball. I mean, my guess would be the easiest way to handle it. Yeah. And I think that it becomes feasible because then you're only talking about, what is it? I'm just doing yeah. my math here. Eight teams. Yeah. So eight teams, in two or three cities, perfectly feasible. Yeah, because the goal here is you want to have multiple ballparks to do it. You can't. You don't want to have what the a- NHL is dealing with right now, where if games run over, you sort of have to push the schedule around to make it work. I don't. I think that's a problem they want to avoid. Yeah, you probably do it in cities that like New York and Chicago and L.A., where you have multiple ballparks. Uh, obviously, you're going to have a weird situation if you do it, say, in New York, where you could have the Yankees or the Mets playing their home games in their home park and maybe they get an unfair advantage for that, but there's a, uh, doesn't seem to be another choice here. No, I don't think it's much a home field advantage though. Cause not like the fans are going to be there. It's going to be empty ballpark. So it's not really much of an advantage other than batting last. Uh, that, that's sort of true. Although baseball is unique in the fact that obviously every ballpark is different and you can build your team for your ballpark. Uh, it's not like basketball in that sense where every court, the exact same. So, now, the Yankees obviously build their team to play in Yankee Stadium. They have a lot of right-handed power hitters who can kind of poke the ball out in into the right center field chest stream over there. So uh, it's an advantage they have. And, and the Mets are, at least in theory, should build their team for City Field. But that's a that's a whole other story with the outfield deep that those guys have. Maybe they, maybe they haven't done that. Yeah, that's a theory for another day. Let's go to the football, which is why I think the more interesting stuff is the college. I think we should go there first because obviously, as of recording on Friday the 14th, the most the entire FCS is not playing fall sports. The FBS, the Big Ten is shut down. The Pac-12 is shut down for the fall. The MAC and the Mountain West is shut down. But some of the other leagues are playing on. Let's see your immediate thoughts on the, where we are right now. So last time I was on, we talked about this a little bit and I told you that I thought it would be immoral to play college football and I, I'm standing by that uh, and I think what you're seeing happen now is exactly the issue that I raised back then 
if the NCAA and the big conferences want to continue to tell us that these are student athletes and amateurs, then how can you possibly treat them different than the rest of the student body? If the student body's not coming back to campus for class, then why are the athletes there to play football? It, it just it doesn't make any sense. So you would have to pay these guys, and I think that's what's going on. Uh, I think all the big conferences should shut down. I'm, I'm waiting for the SEC and the ACC to, uh, and, the, and the Big 12 to realize that it's not just going to happen. It's just not going to happen, and I think that's coming in a matter of weeks. But, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's where we are. I, I don't think you can play college football because if you want to continue to tell us that these are amateur athletes, then you have to treat them like amateur athletes. Yeah, I think the thing that's interesting is here is obviously it's like the NCAA sort of really punted the fall championships thing because people don't realize that the NCAA is not control like college football's playoff. That's an independent entity. They control the championships for soccer. They control it for volleyball. They control it for cross country and anything else that plays in the fall. So they basically waited until the enough of the leagues canceled. It went under 50%. Then Mark Emmer came out and said, oh, we're canceling, which... That takes out everything else. So at this point, you only have the FBS football leagues attempting to play, which I think is not a great look for college. No, it's, it's a terrible look because it's an obvious money grab. There's no other reason why they would play football other than money. And I understand that these schools are going to lose a lot of money without football. Uh, the, the numbers have been made public. And I think... Syracuse University, for instance, even, which is you don't think of as a football powerhouse, but they were in a position where no football is going to cost them hundreds of millions of dollars. So, so I get it from that standpoint. But again, the problem is that you have what you call amateur athletes. That you have a situation where the students are not being asked to return to campus. So why are the football players there? Makes no sense. Yeah, my counter to you is good. I'm gonna make the I'm gonna ask you the argument that the has been made on Twitter by all the people who are freaking out about college football. Like, let's say we go to Notre Dame, which is in the ACC. They're playing to play football. All their students right now are they open the campus of students. The students are going back for classes, and the, the people people arguing these people are making saying, "Hey, the students are back. Why can't the athletes play?" That's sort of the argument they're going on. What do you think about that? Well, look, and I don't know Notre Dame specifically, but from what I understand. Most colleges, if they are back, are back in some sort of a limited fashion. They're not back in a they're, they're social distancing the, the lecture halls, using hybrid classes, things of that sort. Football is a high transmission sport, so it, it's it's a little different than saying, "Oh, well, look, they're letting half the American history class take the class in person." Okay, great. That's it's not the same as throwing kids out there to play football against each other where they're necessarily going to spread this virus. There, there's no way around it. Yeah, and this is one thing. I look at the Pac-12, actually. I'm respecting them the most in this process. They actually put out a full document documenting their reasons why they're not playing football. And they said right at the top, three big things. Number one, virus transmission in the areas where we're playing football is still way too high, and we can't. And then the risk of traveling by airplane to play these games is not good. Number two is that the health risk of the athletes, specifically the myocarditis, it, that it, the Big Ten's had 10 football players already developed that just from getting COVID, and that's not good. It's a very rare condition to begin with. And the third is that the frequency of the test results is just not quick enough because they're getting these back like five, six days later. It doesn't do them much good. Yeah, and look, I don't, I don't necessarily believe the Pac-12 that that is really what's driving their decision. I think it's the keeping the charade of amateurism. But, uh, uh, yeah, I, but the, the, the logic makes sense there from a medical standpoint. And, you know, I'm not, again, not a doctor, but I think everybody sees that this virus affects people differently. And some of the factors are even just body weight. And, you know, let's face it, football players are big guys, especially the linemen. Uh, they're, you know, they're, I don't want to say overweight, but, but they're big, they're big guys. So I would think that that's got to be a heightened risk factor. Yeah, that's true. And they also bring up a point about the potential of the rapid testing being an issue, which is something we've heard with that they're pu- why they push back to the springs. So, oh, if we have a rapid test available because this is not the NFLs I brought up. This is not Major League Baseball. This is not like 
billion dollar like schools where you can say, oh, we'll just test them every day. They don't have the financial capability to do that because they're supposed to also run the school and support the students who are going not just the athletes. So I think a lot of these factors also comes down to, hey, like it's going to be too expensive for us to do these tests as often as we need to to keep the athletes safe. At that point, they said, you know, it's not worth it for us on a liability perspective. Yeah, look, even the even Major League Baseball has been unable to get rapid testing in the clubhouses. So why why would you expect universities to be able to do so? You're you're 100 percent right about that, and that now that unfortunately goes all the way up to the federal government uh, for their failure to get us adequate testing. Now what are we five months into this pandemic? Six, almost six. Yeah, still not adequate testing. So that's uh. You know, if, if you want to look at uh, who are we going to blame, maybe, maybe maybe it starts at the top there with the president. Yeah, we'll get to him in a minute. But my point was more like right now the testing option available is that PCR nasal swab test where they basically like stick the swab all the way up your nose to get the get the sample from up there to figure out if it's if it's positive or not. And those are not cheap tests, and those have very long turnarounds. And if you're a athletics department, like you don't have that kind of massive budget that like the NFL does to run the tests, so. Is it fair to the athlete to say, okay, here we go. Like Ohio state can test their guys like six times, like, like twice a week when, whereas like, let's say Ohio university can only test them once a week. That's not as fair. Right. right. Okay. I I see your point now. Yeah. uh, Agreed. Uh, And and that's a, a distinction between the organization of professional sports versus college sports. So, you know, in major league baseball, for instance, uh, the Yankees don't get more of a testing budget than the Pittsburgh Pirates. Everybody's got the same budget because it comes from the league itself. College doesn't work that way. It's the individual colleges. So you're right. Ohio State can obviously do far more testing than Miami University in Ohio can. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's where you end up uh, with disparities. Yeah, I think that's obviously the big one of the big issues with this. And I think... The thing that's interesting is that you've seen, like, the athletes themselves have started to speak up. We saw Trevor Lawrence's campaign talking about, oh, like, we want to play. They got the hashtag going on Twitter, a bunch of athletes speaking out. So do you feel like the athletes have gotten a fair enough voice in this in this process? Well, no, but, but they never get a fair enough vote in this, in this process because they don't have a union. So they're kind of, they're kind of at the whim of their schools. Uh and, and look, I, I respect if they want to play, okay, but it's not really, it's not a decision that they should be able to make entirely by themselves because, like we said earlier, it has public health aspects to it. So, uh, but no, I don't think the athletes have gotten a fair say because they, they don't have a union. No, we've seen some of the athletes in the Pac-12 talked about, like, union type of principles that haven't come through yet. I think this is definitely something with, I think this is, you start opening the cookie jar with that, and it's going to be hard to close it with that coming forward. Yeah, well, um, and I can't imagine that the Pac-12 schools didn't take that into consideration when they shut down sports. So I'm, I'm, they do not want the student-athletes in some sort of a union. Yeah, I also think the schools themselves, I think, are concerned about liability in terms of like, oh, like, my son on the football team got coronavirus, I'm going to sue the school. Like, and this has made me wonder, like, do you think that these schools, like, if they do, if the SEC and the ACC and the Big 12 do intend to push on, do you think it's going to be something like, oh, like, here's a waiver you have to sign if you want to play. If you can, you can opt out if you want, but if you're going to play football, you have to sign this waiver absolving us of any legal responsibility if you get the virus. Yeah, I think that's likely. Although, uh, I got to say that I personally think that the risks of lawsuits related to getting the coronavirus are overblown. Uh, It's going to be an extremely difficult case to prove. How do you prove that you got the virus from playing football? If if I were defending that case, I'd say, well, where else did you go? Oh, you went to the grocery store? Maybe you got the virus there. Oh, you, you went to get gas? Maybe you got the virus there. So uh, I, I think it's a, I think people are overreacting about the danger of that. Uh, you've heard it from Congress also talking about liability waivers and, and things like that. But but that said, better safe than sorry, I guess, if you're the school. But yeah, I do think you're going to have waivers like that. I think the thing you brought up is more interesting is the idea. I think the amateurism aspect is definitely the more interesting optic here, especially like I brought this up last week on the podcast. I said, hey, like imagine we'll go back to Notre Dame for a second. Notre Dame opens the campus 
After three weeks, Notre Dame says, okay, we can't have students here anymore. We're going to do classes only online for the rest of the semester. And at that point, if you have the athletes on campus playing football games, you're basically opening yourself to the camera and say, hey, like, only your employees are on campus. Why aren't your players being paid like employees are? Yep. That's, and that, that is the big reason that this is uh, shutting down, in my opinion. That is the bigger economic risk to these schools than – a lawsuit about coronavirus is to keep the charade of amateurism going. Uh, the the NCAA and in this case the power conferences are coming closer and closer to losing that issue. Every day, courts around the country are giving these players more and more power. There, some California decisions that they can go make money on their likeness now, and, and things like that. Uh, so. The, the universities are afraid of that, and this is a prime example. You, if you treat these pe- athletes differently than you treat the other students, you have broken the student-athlete, uh, I guess, promise that you, you make, that they're student-athletes, students. For, if the other students are home and they're not, that, that's a bunch of baloney. Yeah, and this is the sort of thing you talk about. You see why, why you don't have an NCAA football vi- video game anymore because of the lawsuit by Ed O'Bannon a few years back to the basketball game and said, hey, like, that's me in the game. I'm not getting any profit off the fact that I use my likeness to make a character in the video game. And stuff like that is opening up the can of worms where they're like, okay, well, it opens up to the haves and the have-nots. Like, I can pay more. And they want to sort of keep the lid on that as long as they can. Yeah, sure. There, there was a time when uh, I remember this well, uh, Jay Billis, uh, obviously the college basketball analyst is also an attorney, uh, believe it or not. And he was on Sports Center, and he made a point that well, basically could have, I think, helped them win the lawsuit. Uh, but his point was that if I were to go at that time on the University of Florida's website and type in Tim Tebow, the number 15 jersey came up for sale. So how are you going to tell me that that number 15 jersey isn't the, Tim Tebow's name? Of course it is. Uh, I think they had shut that. They shut that down within minutes of him saying that on the air. But uh, those lawsuits cause it's a it's a fine line, and frankly, I think a BS line between amateur and professional when you're talking about these high powered college programs of football and basketball. Yeah, and that's true. Basketball is its own set of issues. You can deal with that another time because basketball are talking already about like doing bubbles and stuff like that. So we'll see what happens then. But the football, now this is really the point where stuff is getting canceled. So the Big Ten being a big blow, and now you're seeing like blowback everywhere. The Big Ten is typically Nebraska, I think, is an interesting case because Nebraska has basically come out and basically like gone on like, oh, we're going to go try and find our own schedule and play games against whoever we can. I don't think it's a realistic possibility because they would ha- basically be forfeiting all their money from the Big Ten, and they ha- don't have the least clout in the Big Ten because they just joined it along with Nebraska about, like, seven years ago. So what do you think about Nebraska basically threatening to go out on their own? Yeah, well, Nebraska is another school where basically the football program is it's a tremendous source of revenue for the school. So they don't want to – I get it. They don't want to lose it, but that, that's not going to happen. I, I can't imagine they're going to – uh, cipher off from the rest of their conference. That that doesn't sound like a good long term solution for Nebraska. Yeah, especially when you don't know if you can have how many fans you can have in the stands, and that's another issue we can get to. That's more of the NFL's thing right now. But the thing that's happened also is that the part people involved in college football, the big some of the big stakeholders, are having big temper tantrums now that they might not happen. We heard Lou Holtz again go on his argument. Oh. We sent the boys to Normandy in World War II. We can send them to play college football, which, again, you've pointed this out before. Such a dumb argument. Lou Holtz is losing his rocker. Yeah, it's, it's, it's moronic. Uh, you're talking about amateur athletes, not soldiers, not, not even professionals who are getting paid. These guys are amateurs. So it's a stupid argument, but it's, I get where it's coming from. It's coming from football two places. Lifer. And Lou, and yeah, in Lou Holtz's case, it's just somebody who loves football and loves college football. And in a lot of these guys' cases, like Nebraska, it's coming from a position of greed. 
but uh, but like I said at the top of the podcast, I, I just think it's I think it's immoral to do that to what you call student athletes. Yeah, and also getting a lot of political pressure. Obviously, we saw President Trump weigh in, basically jump around the player side, say, "Let them." He tweets out, "Let them play." He's saying, "Oh, I talked to Trevor Lawrence. I talked to Dot Swain. I talked to these coaches, and they want to play. They should play." You've seen a lot of governors in the South threaten, like say, "Oh, they think they need to play football here." What do you take on the political pressure here being put on to try and get keep college football alive? That uh, you don't have to be a political junkie to understand what's going on there, and it's real simple. College football is super popular in certain areas of this country, the Southeast, the Midwest, and I, I guess maybe you could say the, the, the Old West, so to speak, Texas, Oklahoma, that area. Yeah. I think that's, that's the big spots where people watch college football, perhaps even more than professional football in America. And it just so happens that those areas of the country have a lot of swing states in them, Michigan. Ohio, Georgia, Florida, Pennsylvania. And so if you're Donald Trump, you know that your your base in those states wants college football. So here you are supporting college football. And what I think Trump's afraid of is what I alluded to earlier. There's a good argument that the reason we're not going to have college football at least in the Big Ten this year, and I think it's going to be in all the power conferences when it's all said and done, is because of him. Because he's failed to contain this virus. Uh, had he had he listened to the experts and contained it over the summer, I think we'd be in a much better spot now to, to play. Uh, had he taken it seriously all the way back in January and February and gotten the testing in order, we might be in a position where we can do... Uh, rapid testing on a wide, widespread basis, but that's not where we are. And I think Trump is afraid that uh, it's going to get pointed out that it's his fault that we don't have college football. Yeah. That's something I'd be terrified of. If I was a, a Trump supporter because right now a lot of his base is, has basically only been affected like, like with their job. They can, that they can say, Oh, it's the virus and the like liberal government being too, too, like, uh, not the words being too conservative with the reopening. They're trying to, not letting me have my freedom, but the second that's something they enjoy a lot, like college football goes away, they can say, oh, that's not the government, that's the virus doing that, and where's the virus lay? Donald Trump's feet. Yep, and that's uh, and, and that's true of all these professional sports. I mean, the, the reason Trump has a vested interest in getting sports on TV so people feel normal, but college football, like I said, it, it is, I think it's probably, if the number one sport in some of those states we mentioned, in Florida, in Georgia, in Pennsylvania, in Ohio, in Michigan. So if it's not on this fall, come and right when we're going to be electing a new president, there's a chance that those people who look forward to that every Saturday are going to say, man, this is Trump's fault. Yeah, and he also is a f- big fan of going to these games, especially in the South, where, like, remember, he likes to go down to, like, Alabama games, give himself the big ovation. So I think it's also partially ego in there as well. Sure. Uh, I mean, that's that's where his, his base is. Uh, knows that. That's why he, I think he was at, what, was it the Daytona or one of those big NASCAR races? He was there, too. That, yeah. That's where his base is. Uh, you don't see him showing up to uh, some of these other events, like a baseball game in New York, for instance. But, uh, but yeah, from a political standpoint, that's all it is. Trump understands that no college football reflects poorly on him. Yeah, and I think, honestly, I think we're, I think I'm with you. I don't think we're going to see any of them. I think they, they're just putting off the enable of the other three leagues. I think the longer this goes, the virus is not under control. And I think they're going to have problems if the students get back on campus and they're going to start having infection flare ups because that's so many people over so, such little space. At that point, you might, I think they're going to be forced to pull the plug before they can even get a game in. Yeah, well, and, and we know that that's the likelihood because we've already seen it with some of these uh, K-12 through school districts that have opened up around the country, uh, particularly in the South, because in the South, they go back to school in August. Uh, a lot of them opened up, and a week later, they have all the kids home again on quarantine. Yeah. And I can't imagine it's going to be any different on a college campus. So... No. I I think that's going to happen. And when it does happen, uh, the power conferences are going to have a hard time explaining why their football players are still there. 
Yeah, and I think the interesting thing here is like if we do end up going to the spring, you have a whole different health set of health and safety question because obviously in the normal football possible calendar, you play, play in August, you go through the early December, you have the bowl game in January, then you have like a long time to recuperate. If you're playing like an eight game season in the spring, like how fair do these athletes ask them to be ready to play in the fall again? I, and you have to, I think you have to cut the schedule again to get them ready. Probably. Uh, I, I would think so. I, I, I don't really know because we've never had that happen, but uh, I mean, I could tell you as somebody who played high school football and just anybody who watches football, it's a very, very physical game and it takes a toll on your body. And it often takes months to get back to a position where you feel healthy again. And, and that's just not, I'm not even talking about injuries necessarily. Sometimes it's just regular wear and tear of the game. It's a, it's a very physical sport. So, yeah, that, that's a good point that I haven't, I haven't really thought of. I don't know if you can have these guys turn around and be ready to go for summer camp two months later. Yeah, I saw Purdue's coach put out a modified plan for what he would do. And it's like basically, I think it was like eight games starting in January. And then you have a very, you have like a long break and you don't start your next season until like October is 10 games. So basically only you're playing 18 games over the calendar year, but you, you don't do your typical spring summer buildup. You have to give them a break in the middle. Yeah, that, that sounds like a good plan to me. Something like that. Uh, that, that's where we are now. It's it's gotten to the point where, like you said, we're coming on six months. If at this point you don't realize that we're going to have to change the way we do things, the quote unquote new normal, then your head your head's in the sand. Also, I want to point out. I want to put some shame on those, on those school football schools who basically put no thought into this plan of like potential of having to do it in the spring. Because everywhere we heard from is the Big Ten, the Pac-12. Like, oh, we never talked about. It. We're going to be ready for the fall and like. At what point did you not sit there and realize, like, boy, we're going to have a problem here. Like, this is just, like, again, it's sort of like the same thing the president's doing, like, just hoping it'll go away, and that's not a strategy. It's been going on from, like, the top down, from the president all the way down. It's going to go away. Of course, the kids are going to be back in school. Of course, we're going to be playing football. Of course, the movie theaters are going to be open. And month by month goes by, and it gets worse and worse. It's, it's a real... It's a real shame because, uh, yeah, I've read and some articles saying, making this point, this virus has been extraordinarily predictable. It's done exactly what the medical experts told us it was going to do, dating all the way back to March, and yet we haven't been able to listen. It's, it's not like there was some, you know, turn or twist that we didn't expect with this thing. It's behaved exactly like we thought it would, but we just, we can't listen. We, we, we're all in a rush to pretend it doesn't exist. And that's why we're in a position now where we don't have fans in our baseball games then we're not going to have college football. Yeah. I do think we are going to have the NFL. Though. We'll start going that way. Now the NFL seems to have a better handle on things than college does right now. Start with the fact that they apparently have listened to us at, at least through the end of training camp. We're having daily testing for the coronavirus. I think that's obviously a smart step one in the right direction. I think the NFL got lucky in the sense that baseball got going and they saw what happened to the Marlins and they seemed to react to, to that immediately. And you're right. They, they said, all right, we're going to have daily testing. We're going to put in real protocols, not ridiculous nobody's going to swap their jersey after the game and uh i think that it's going to give them a chance to get through the season although i i do have my concerns still yeah i do too right now their thing is like they're also at the point where they want to do a bubble the regular season because i think also they're extremely impractical for a bubble because you don't have bubbles big enough we're gonna have like play enough fields and practice to broadcast all these games and for all these teams to be lodged with all these personnel so what they're talking about doing is like a home team bubble, basically. A lot of these teams in camp, like the Saints and the Cowboys, does basically like all your personnel basically staying in a in a quarantined hotel. They're going from the hotel to the game to the practice and then back. And this is talk about this idea of happening a bit during the regular season, sort of idea of the home team bubble where you basically do the monastic where you go to work, you go home, you don't go out in the community, you don't go do all this stuff. You just basically go here and there and 
limit your travel as much as you can. Do you think this idea has has merit? It's their only shot. It's a uh, so it doesn't even matter if it has merit or not. It's their only shot. Yeah. Because we've we've talked about this a little bit on the podcast, and now I guess we can go into it further. The problem that football has, and you're seeing it, you just saw it with the Cardinals, uh, it, the St. Louis Cardinals. I guess they're going to play tomorrow. But and the Marlins came back with the JV squad. You cannot do that in professional football. Uh, God, can you imagine? Let's say a team's got three or four offensive linemen sick. You're going to play? You're going to put a star quarterback behind some backup offensive lineman? It's not the same as putting a double-A pitcher on the mound and letting him get his brains beat in. You're going to literally let the quarterback get his brains beat in. And that's a, that's a big problem. And there's no way, if I'm an owner, you know, you think, uh, you think John Mara wants to see Daniel Jones behind a third-string offensive line? I don't, I don't think he does. No, so, I don't think the Chiefs want to do it with Patrick Mahomes either. Nope, no way the Chiefs want to see Mahomes behind a third string line. So that that it's that's a problem that football has. It's unique to the sport of football. But this gives them a chance because if you can presumably keep the virus out of the hotel, and all you're doing is going to the practice field, going to the hotel, then you should be able to do it. Uh, something else we talked about that makes a lot of sense to me is travel on game day. And I know these teams are going to complain about it, but suck it up. Uh, there's no reason that the Giants, when they go to Philadelphia, can't get up early in the morning and uh, hop on the bus. Go on, hop on the bus, go on down to Philly, two-hour bus ride. Yeah. Get up at 9 o'clock, you'll be there by 11, kick off at 1 o'clock, you're good. Yeah, I think also, I mean, like, I think if you're doing it where, like, either you're in the hotel or, like, or if you have a house, you go to your house. But I don't think, like, because baseball, the players, for the most part, are doing this, especially in their home areas. And they've seen that their test results, apart from the Marlins and the Cardinals, have been very good in baseball. So the logic is there. But the problem is, like, just, like, you have to trust everybody to do it. And last week we saw a guy at the Seahawks try and, like, sneak a woman into the hotel and get, got himself cut for that. And the NFL is clearly showing no tolerance for this kind of behavior. But, like, you need all the, a lot more guys to buy in than you do for baseball. Absolutely. Uh, and, and we baseball should serve as an omen to the NFL because we saw what happened. All it took was a couple of guys on the Cardinals and the Marlins. To, and and oh, I should say allegedly because we don't know. But allegedly all it took was a couple of guys to go out and – all of a sudden, everybody's sick. Uh, I can't imagine that's going to be better in football in a contact sport where practice is spent in close quarters sweating on each other and breathing on each other. So I think uh, I think the NFL needs to be extra diligent, uh, diligent about this and make sure that nobody is breaking that bubble. Yeah, that's true. One thing that may be in their favor is that we've seen reports recently on Pro Football Talk that the NFL believes they're close to having a rapid COVID test, supposedly 97% accurate, which basically would cut the testing time down significantly and would basically be like, oh, like you spit in the cup and you'll know within like 15 minutes if you have the COVID or not. And if they have a test that accurate, I think it's not only a game changer for the, the league, but for the country as a whole. I want to know how, like, how surprised you be that they seem to have this and the country hold is not? Yeah, I don't quite understand that, to be honest with you. But if if that's true, then you're right. That changes the entire game plan for America. You can have no reason you can't have uh, anything, really, then. You just have to have people spit in the cup, wait the 15 minutes, and if they're clear, you're good to go. If they're not clear, uh, then, then we got a problem. Um so, yeah, I think that that's, that would be great. I don't quite understand why the NFL has this technology and seemingly nobody else does. But if uh, if they have it and we can mass produce it, it'll help the country. If they have it and they can keep it, it's going to help the NFL. Yeah, and two other things the NFL has considered. One, in, one's in relation to college football, and I think – this is clear. I think, like, if we don't have college football Saturdays, I think you can lock in the bank. The NFL is going to move some games to Saturday nights to get another broadcast window. Oh, absolutely. I, I personally, I 
and this is coming from somebody who's not a college football fan, um, a professional football fan. I, I like Saturday Night Football. Uh, and I think that the NFL, all the NFL has to do is look at the ratings that they normally get on Saturday night games. And now look at the ratings that major league baseball is getting on these Saturday night games. Uh, Fox national televised ones are getting huge ratings. So yeah, that that seems like a no brainer to me. Yeah. This is only like a one year fix because there is an antitrust exemption. The NFL has that they can't go on Saturday nights or Friday nights before the end of the high school and college football season. So I, either they got big numbers, it would be very hard to get the politicians to let them keep doing it. Yeah, the politicians are not going to let them keep doing it. You're right. But for one year, where there's no college football, that seems like a no-brainer. Plus, I can't, ima- I can't imagine that Donald Trump would have to be thrilled about that if that happens. So I can't imagine the president's going to do something yeah. to stop that. Yeah, I don't think he would either. And the other one is right now, there are still some teams out there that are crazy enough to think they can actually have some fans in their stadiums. We have five so far who said no, both New York teams, the Red, the Washington football team, excuse me, the Raiders, I forget what the fifth one is, but there are still some holdouts who think they're going to have fans there, including the Dallas Cowboys. And it's according to Ed Werner's Twitter, Cowboys owner Jerry Jones says AT&T Stadium has a quote-unquote naturally built airflow that can help keep fans safe during this pandemic. Quote, I'm really proud that we have that stadium to work with. Quote, he says stadium protocols for game days coming end of the week. And I just, I don't get this. Like, we are being told that the it's not safe for the players to stay outside the hotel, yet Jerry's comfortable having fans in his building? I mean, you, you understand it. You just don't want to understand that it. it's money. That's all it is. It's greed. Uh, and, and it's disappointing to see Jerry Jones be that greedy. But that's Jerry Jones, so I'm not surprised. But that, that's what it is. The owners are greedy. They want people in the stands because people in the stands equal money. And it's not just the NFL owners. You know, with, I heard the Cincinnati Reds are looking at getting people into their ballpark. It, it, these guys are greedy, and they're willing to jeopardize people's health for it. Uh, and, uh, you know, part of me says, should I, do I blame them? Is it their fault? Maybe it's not. Maybe it's. If you look at Jerry Jones, Jerry Jones shouldn't even have the ability to do that. Maybe the blame goes to Governor Abbott. And so if the politicians aren't preventing me from doing it, is it really my job to is it my job to care about the public health if they don't? I guess that's the question. Yeah, it's a it's more of like a moral issue where like you can see he's putting the buck ahead of his fan ahead of his fans' livelihood and he's contributing to a public health crisis potentially because Texas is one of those areas where the virus is spread is still pretty unchecked. So, like, you'd have, like, a mass experiment. Let's say you put, like, 25% capacity at AT&T Stadium. You th- even their social distance, you can't control that with the amount of staff you have. And there's a lot of yelling. There's a lot of screaming. You have the masks on. There's still a lot of potential for a super spreader event there, and that's not a good look for an NFL owner to be having. No, not, not at all. I'm not trying to absolve Jerry, but what I'm saying is, uh, you know, maybe, maybe his – Governor Abbott shouldn't even give him that choice. Unfortunately, Governor Abbott would because FC Dallas down there, the MLS team has already had fans in the building, had 3,000 fans at a game like last week, and they had them spread out, but we won't know for a couple of weeks how much of a disaster that could end up being. Yeah, uh, I can't imagine it's going to be good. Uh, does not seem like it does not make much sense to me, but, you know, that then especially in a place like Texas. I think there may be some places in the country that are getting better. I know that Governor Cuomo in New York is talking about opening up movie theaters and gyms again uh, and bowling alleys. We'll see. But I don't think people should be sitting in professional football stadiums uh, in the state of Texas. Yeah, and just for reference for those people who are saying, oh, it's New York's allowing stuff to happen. One, they're still not allowing fans in the sports stadiums. That, that is, that's I don't think that's happening until you have a vaccine of some sort. And right now, the infection rate in New York for a lot of these is like it's been around 0.8%, 0.9% most of the week. Texas is still like well above that, and they're talking about letting 25,000 fans in AT&T Stadium? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's not, not a smart idea. Uh not not a smart public health idea whatsoever, in, in my opinion. Yeah, it's not for sure. One last thing before I let you go. Like, 
Look, I'm, I think we're sick to talk about the health concern right now. One interesting legal thing right now: New York State, one of the few, one of the major holdouts in terms of the online sports gambling industry. There are reports out recently that there is a movement to try and legalize online gambling in New York State. Do you have a take on that? I think it's an absolute no-brainer, and I think they should do it tomorrow. Uh, the state, it's no secret, the state has a tremendous budget problem now. The state was having a budget problem prior to this pandemic because, uh, and I don't want to get too much into the weeds here, but uh, I guess I'll go, and if I'm too far in, you can stop me. But uh, in 2017, the president got his tax law passed and part of his new tax law was that we were going to cap what's called the salt deduction, state and local taxes at $10,000. It used to be unlimited. So Rich, as anybody who knows who lives in New York, your state and local taxes, especially if you're a rich guy, are way, way above $10,000 between your property taxes and your state income taxes and New York City income taxes, etc. So what ended up happening when that happened is a lot of New Yorkers said, screw it, I can't deduct those taxes from my federal return, I'm out of here. And they moved to places like Florida and North Carolina and Texas that have no or low state income tax. Uh, so that that caused a big budget concern for the state. Now you've had the pandemic, which is an even bigger budget concern for the state because you obviously have people losing money. People lost a lot of money lost a lot of jobs. The state had to expend a lot of money to get ventilators and things like that. So the state's in the budget hole and gambling is a, just seems like a no brainer way to get out of that hole. Uh, you obviously the, they have it in New Jersey. Now the state gets a cut of every bet that's made and that people are sitting at home with nothing to do. You don't think they'd, be betting on baseball and football like crazy on their cell phones? I do. So to me, it seems like it's a no-brainer. It's an easy budget, uh, e- easy revenue grab that doesn't require raising taxes on anybody. Yeah, I do think it's something, I think, especially given the very, very slow response from the federal government, because the state has been asking for aid from the federal government for a while now. It's basically been fighting in the Senate about how much money to give out in the next coronavirus relief bill. And the, and the states never seem to get any of it. So this might be something I know the governor has been opposed to this in the past. It might not be, might be a situation where they just don't have a choice where like, we're not getting the money from Washington. We need to try and come up with some, so we don't have to cut essential services, like cut like schools or cut the salaries or firefighters or police and stuff like that. Right. It's either that or raise taxes on people. Neither is a, a very popular option. So why not legalize, sports gambling, let, you know, let people like me and you sit in our house and we want to put a bet on the Giants game on our cell phones, fine, go ahead, do it. Yeah, just understand that the casino that you place that bet with is going to be paying a percentage of that money to us, to us being the state. Yeah, I think that seems like no brainer. I think it is no brainer. Phil, thanks for all the time today. I really appreciate it. All right, thanks, Mike. Uh, happy to happy to be on, and uh, we'll talk soon. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we can talk some NFL football in the fall. Yeah, hopefully we'll be doing some picks at some point, Alan. Hope we get far enough along the road that we're having some fun games to discuss. But have you ch- have you been a Hard Knocks guy in the past? I've never really watched Hard Knocks. I watched a little bit when Rex Ryan was doing the "Let's Go Have Some Snacks," but uh, no, I've I've not been much of a Hard Knocks guy. I, I'm I'm not much of a training camp guy, to be honest with you. Uh, I'm, I'm sick of, you know, every training camp, it's, oh, the, this guy's a star, that guy's a star, and then you never hear from him again. Uh, I'm a sucker for baseball spring training where everybody's in the best shape of their life, but NFL training camp, never really been much much of a, a fan. Well, I am. I did keep an eye on it this year, especially because the two team things and the first look at what football is like and the coronavirus reality. I'm going to break down the premiere of Hard Knocks with the great Joe Dalizio right after this.